John said, I've been teaching Arabic language and literature at Stanford for 21 years. So last year was my 20th year. And one of the reasons that I have been able to uh, survive 20 years of teaching is uh, the fact that I got this radio show. And it's called Arabology, and it airs on KZSU 90.1 FM, which is Stanford's FM uh, radio station. And this old man turns into a DJ in the evening, and the, the uh, goal of the uh, show is really to highlight Arabic music and that's what I want to do with you today because a lot of people you know would like to know more about Arabic music but the language is often a barrier and even more than the language sometimes it's the context that's a barrier so I wanted to introduce you today to kind of new Arabic music in fact the kind of Arabic music that was born during the Arab Spring back in 2011. This kind of music to me is revolutionary. It's amazing and it's also something that I think no matter where you are in the world, you're gonna feel inspired by it. It's usually by these young people, these young musicians who aren't commercial, uh, you know, so musicians, they're not endorsed by Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola or whatever in the Middle East. They're fiercely independent and they're, sing and they're singing against oppression. They're singing against uh, the oppression of women, marginalized sexualities and such in the Arab world. And I've had the pleasure of bringing uh, a few of them to Stanford and they have really made an impact. So hopefully through my my uh, PowerPoint today and through the short video excerpts that I'm going to play, you'll get a feel of what the Arab world is going through right now musically. Because with all the troubles going on in the Middle East and everything we see, and maybe because of that, there is such an amazing wave of new singers and new musicians who, who are, you know, uh, trying to express what they're going through musically. The music you're going to hear is going to be hopefully surprising to you. And uh, don't be shocked if you hear Arabic hip hop. Like who knew that, you know, hip hop could lend itself so well to Arab musicians in the Arab world today. Well, if you think about how hip hop originated in the States, you know, or in the West, then, you know, it's such an amazing subversive tool to think about oppression. So they, they borrow from that. They mix it with, you know, um, the Middle Eastern uh, type music and scales. And then they come up with this beautiful fusion that I think will end up appealing to young people in the Arab world as well as everybody in the West. So I'm about to share my screen um, Denise with everybody. So the first singer I want to talk about today, the first musician, his name is El General. Now, obviously, this is not his real name, because, and he's using uh, this uh, pseudonym or this very anonymous name. His real name we now know is Hamada bin Amro. And this kid, uh, really, if I were to say what's started the Arab Spring musically, what fueled the music of the Arab Spring as we first uh, witnessed it, I think it was this song. It is called Rais Liblad to the president of Tunisia at the time. And he went all out. He was singing to him about um, the fact that most Tunisians are educated, that there are PhDs who can't find jobs, that the way they're living under that system, they get, they don't have any freedom of speech, etc. So this is back when the Arab Spring was very, a very positive thing. We were all optimistic when we heard this song, and especially when we saw that his song and others from Tunisia led to the actual uh, overthrow of the government there. And I think, and, um, and this is debatable, but I think, you know, although the Arab Spring has, I don't know, turned into an Arab winter, unfortunately, in so many parts of the uh, Middle East right now, uh, I think this is only a stage, but I think in Tunisia it has been more successful than others. And it's largely due to, uh, to this guy whose name is El General. And uh, do you want to hear him? You're going to hear the anger in his voice. 
and also there will be uh, subtitles, but this is this uh, Arabic hip hop's gonna go so fast. <laughs> Obviously, in this video, he's wearing a hat. He's trying to cover his face. This video, you know, the government was trying to censor and to take offline, but it would, you know, they would delete it from YouTube. It would pop up somewhere else. And really, this kid single-handedly represented the voice of the youth who had had enough. I'd love to hear, you know, if only a sentence from one of you about, you know, did you, what did you think when you saw this video? There's certainly no budget. It was homemade, but the impact it had. Uh, um, in this video, uh, Denise had sent around some of the links before, and I had a chance to take a look at, some oh, of the, uh, at a bunch of the material. And in, I think in this particular video, he talks repeatedly the refrain about marigolds, about everywhere there are marigolds. And... Could you talk about the significance? I'm thinking, you know, it, it's used in, in some places. It represents uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the flowers of Mary. In other places, it represents um, uh, pest control, right? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. what's the what's the context here for marigolds? So I'm like you, Adam. I mean, when I hear these references, I wonder where they come from. So, you know, I always think, does it come from the Quran? Is it somehow Islamic, you know? And there might be references to that and the idea of miracles like that. And how can we equate that to the uh, um, Arab Spring and, and what was going on? And, uh, you know, and, and he, he does mention that as part of this very angry rhetoric. Did you hear it? Like how right. you know, raw it was and how uh, he, you know he was attacking the president unheard of in Tunisia at the time to to uh, criticize the president much so let's make a video and for it to go viral and for that video to fuel the people in the street right and the juxtaposition of the anger with the flowers like what is the I'm, I'm loving that in fact adam you're giving me like a whole new way of thinking about it perhaps it's deliberate i mean we, we probably would ask uh, el general but I, it does stand to me as, as you know it's a juxtaposition it's a paradox as they're both existing at the same time the very word you know arab spring gives me an image of flowers that are, you know, growing, etc., And that is juxtaposed with the, uh, the reality and the harsh reality that these uh, young people were facing. Uh, El General was arrested several times. He was tortured. The poor kid disappeared from the map for a while, but then they would release him and he would be bruised and he would go back to the streets and continue singing this song. Um, and then of course he went from this, you know, enemy of the state to suddenly the voice of free Tunisia, you know. So a, a good lesson for people who persevere, perhaps. Thank you, Adam. Um, so I guess you guys, uh, I guess everybody's waiting for the next uh, person from Tunisia. Now here's a voice of a woman. And this young woman is amazing. Her name is Amal Masluthi, and she composed this song herself. It's called Kilmiti Hurra. If you don't speak Arabic, it means my word is free, meaning my word is free and unencumbered. And so if you look at the two videos I have on the screen, the top one here shows Amal Masluthi in the streets of Tunisia. This is a very special video that was, you know, shot as they were going through the revolution. So she was literally in the street with her fellow Tunisians singing about liberty and freedom of speech. And in the video, there is almost, you could almost hear the police coming towards her and her continuing to sing just with her voice and mobilizing the masses, which again is an, an example of how music can charge a revolution. I'm gonna show you Amal as she was back in 2011.
she had panic on her face and she wanted to sit down. And basically, um, it was because the police were coming and then you heard the masses kind of go, go on, Amal, we're with you, Amal. Nevertheless, Amal was uh, arrested. She, uh, she was tortured under the regime at the time. And uh, the happy ending is that once Tunisia was quote unquote free, Amal Masluthi became the female voice of Tunisia and became so popular and so respected for all she had endured that, well, one, we brought her to Stanford. Thank you to the Abbasi program at the time, call it. We, we, we brought her and she sang here at the Bing uh, Theater. It was amazing at the Bing Concert Hall. She sang the same song. And she was invited by the Nobel Prize uh, uh, ceremony to sing that same song, only c c compare little Amal in the streets with almost nothing to this kind of performance at the Nobel Peace Prize concert many years later. between Amal in the street and Amal at the uh, Nobel Prize uh, ceremony, Peace Prize ceremony in uh, Sweden. Uh, anybody want to comment about Amal Mastuthi? Have you heard of her? Um, she is on the playlist. You'll find her. And the video I played did have English subtitles. So obviously, if you maximize it through the playlist, you'd be able to uh, understand every word she's saying. What did you think of Amal before or after? I have a question, if it's okay. Yeah, of course, Thank Lauren. You. Is she now recognized as a national treasure? I mean, the difference from where she started to now, is, is she safe? Is, is she staying in Tunisia? What is, what is her goal? That's such a great question. And I can answer that one, Adam, because I, I do uh, know Amal because we brought her to Stanford. And certainly after she was tortured and imprisoned so many times and considered an enemy of the state, she did leave Tunisia. She ended up in New York and she got married in New York and had a daughter, everything. But Tunisia stayed in her heart. So now, currently, this demonized figure in during the Arab Spring has now become the hero. She was just in Tunisia where she was welcomed with roses and carnations and you know to her it was surreal because her experience in Tunisia has always been that of fear of, of living in the margins of being afraid to speak and, and I guess this is you know sad but true. Uh, a lot of Arab countries, if you make it in the West, suddenly they have a newfound admiration for you. But we still need that legitimacy to come from the West. And what I'm always telling people, especially in the Arab world, you know, we have so much uh, going on in the Arab world in terms of talent. Why is it that we only admire our local talent once it's acknowledged with a Western seal or stamp? Amal Masluthi has, you know, become a huge artist. She's just released a new album. Um, and so, yes, Lauren, the answer to your question is she went from, uh, you know, devil to goddess with no stopping in between. Anyway, I, uh, please do watch her video at your leisure um, from the YouTube playlist, especially watch the one I picked because I did find you one with English subtitles. I'm going to move to Egypt now because, as we know, the Tunisian Revolution spilled into Egypt and uh, Egypt was trying to continue 
that at the time optimistic wave of a better tomorrow. And in Egypt, I guess the closest thing we have to El General is this young man whose name is Rami Aysam. And Rami Aysam, he was one of the, and still is one of the bravest musicians I've ever encountered. I mean, this guy literally would be bleeding on the stage from uh, rubber bullets or um, violence from the government at the time, of course, it was Mubarak, and yet he would be uh, singing out in, despite his uh, tears. I'm going to show you Rami Aysam and the way he mobilized the masses back in uh, uh, 2011 2012 in uh, Egypt. <laughs> وعايز اقول لاي حد من اي طائفه او من اي فكر موجود ما تسمعش كلام القاده بتوعك ما تبقاش تابع خليك تابع لبلدك خليك تابع لمصر بس ما تنساش الشهداء احنا مش محتاجين ننزل دلوقتي نهتف لاشخاص مش محتاجين ننزل الشارع عشان اشخاص الحد الوحيد اللي يستحق يكون رئيس للبلد دي Let's see what you guys think of Rami uh, Aysam after him. <laughs> Did you feel the kind of music he was singing was very different than the kind of music maybe we're used to in the West? Or did you feel that he somehow, you know, had fusion, like he fused Arabic lyrics with somehow of a, maybe a rock sound or an indie sound? John, what did you think? Well, I've, I've, I heard you pre present this last year, uh, but I remember both times being struck by, yeah, his sound sounding a lot more like a MTV style presentation. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Even the video is so polished, you know. Um, a lot of the people you saw in the video that appeared were actually activists. They're all, you know, polished up now and they're singing. Um, you know, I don't know if he's lost his edge, but Rami, I saw him after being, <coughs> excuse me, after being uh, demonized, then idolized with the present system. He's got kicked out of the country. He's been threatened. He got political asylum in Sweden, and he's now singing about oppression in Egypt in Arabic from Sweden. This is an example, unlike Amal Maslouthi, of a musician who's not able to go back. I mean, it would be suicide for him to go back. He's not um, uh, welcomed by the present government in Egypt. So anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in. Um, Another group uh, from Egypt that revolutionized, I think, the, the music scene, uh, they're called Kairoki. Uh, so they're playing on karaoke and Cairo. So you got Kairoki. And uh, they joined with this amazing singer whose name is Aida Al Ayubi. You can see her there. And this is a song that's kind of on the sad side, unlike Rami Aysam's more, um, I don't know, uplifting song in terms of the second video he was doing. This is sort of uh, recalling what happened in the Tahrir Square and uh, how many people died in order to achieve some kind of independence and liberty. <laughs> Sure. 
So uh, she was known before the uh, Arab Spring, and uh, but Kairoki weren't that popular. And when they teamed with her, they were able to appeal both to, I guess, my generation, the older generation, because I know her songs since, you know, since before the revolution. But then I got to know Kairoki, and I feel very hip that I know a group who's, who's that popular in Egypt. Uh, Kairoki still uh, perform in Egypt, but their new CD that they released, they had to censor three or four songs. They had to change the, the government asked or the censorship bureau belonging to the government asked them to censor certain lines. And I think Kairoki hated doing that, but at the same time they wanted to release it. So if you look carefully on YouTube, you'll find the uncensored versions of their songs and the censored ones. Between you and me, go for the uncensored. Any idea, any thoughts about Aida Ayubi and Kairoki? Um, I was curious. There was, I watched the show Rami on um, Hulu. Yes. And it really talks about um, in the lot when he goes to Egypt at the end of the show, and he talks about like how shocked he is that, that people are kind of in this really unsteady peace, like that they're, yeah. you know, most of the people he encounters don't want to talk about what he's like heard about and why he wants to he, you know he's coming from the u.s right. so curious, like if this is also showing up in the music like this kind of reflection of like what rami sees yes actually if rami's experiences were to be put into song maybe this would be it um no the, the what is your name oh hi Silali. Okay, Silali is, is talking about a, a series on Hulu that was just released, it's called Rami. And you know, the Arab American community, we are so thrilled uh, to have to finally have a, a show, a series that features an Arab American character or even an Arab character who is not, you know, a terrorist or whatever. So this was actually amazing for us to, I mean, I subscribed to Hulu just to access that season. Uh, mm -hmm. I watched all 12 episodes and it is, it talks about, you know, the Arab American experience when they go back to Egypt and you go back full of optimism and you want to connect with your country or the country of your parents and you go up speaking Arabic at home in the U.S. And often when you go back, you find that people don't want to talk about, you know, the Arab Spring. Some, and often, of course, it's because they're afraid to. Some of them, it's too painful. But for many people, I think in, in Egypt today, and we just saw some recent demonstrations, so people are still attempting to relight the Arab Spring despite everything. But again, I think people there are afraid and I think people are still looking for escape. And I think in Rami's case, didn't they all want to know about America? Like they wanted to speak English with him. And he said, but I'm coming back to Egypt so I can speak my own language finally in, in, in an Arabic country. And you no, know, people wanted free English lessons from him, trying to impress him that they had, uh, you know, the latest iPhone. And, you know, he says, I come from the land of iPhone. Uh, so yes, thank you for bringing that up. Um, Tunisia, uh, from Tunisia, from Tunisia to Egypt and from Egypt to Libya. And I guess I, I won't play that now, but uh, this is another um, rapper who came from Libya. His name is Ibn Thabit. And uh, if you read the lyrics I wrote for you, uh, they would go with the Arabic uh, video, uh, the video with the song in Arabic. And it's about, you know, a lot of people don't understand the loss of life that happened in Libya uh, when the Arab Spring spilled into Libya. And I think by that time, the Arab Spring had been hijacked by so many outside forces and inside forces that instead of it being a new rosy tomorrow, we were looking at so many young people dying, especially in Libya. And uh, Ibn Thabit kind of represents the voice of the Libyan youth. Um, so, I'm going to move to uh, Lebanon, and I'm going to move to Mashru Leila, and this is going to be worth your, your time, everybody. Who's heard of Mashru Leila? Nobody's heard of Mashru Leila. They were just in San Francisco, and uh, they were sold out in San Francisco, and the Lebanese band singing in Arabic last Saturday, I went there. 
And I couldn't believe it because, you know, half the audience was Americans who don't speak English, I mean, don't speak Arabic, sorry. And uh, they were there just because they loved the energy, they loved the music, they loved the message. And then we had a lot of Arab Americans who, especially the young uh, people, who were able to relate their, their music so it wasn't the Arabic music of their parents. And then you had everybody else. Um, this group, Mashru'a Layla, surfaced right around the Arab Spring. But instead of being, you know, anti-government, they are anti-government. They, they, they're talking about the corruption in the Lebanese government. And they formed this band and they called themselves Mashru'a Layla. They started at the American University in Beirut. And now they are sold out all over the world, going around singing songs. So I was lucky to know them back when they were at the, at the uh, American University in Beirut. They were just, what, freshmen and sophomore. And I was in Lebanon and people said to me, you got a radio show, you got to hear this band. So I got to meet them and, uh, and hear their music. And I'm glad because I'm now able to, you know, talk about them in terms of their 10 year anniversary and how much they've evolved. Uh, one of the reasons that Mashru'a Layla really gained momentum is that they took the uh, anti-government uh, feeling that was represented in the music that we heard, already heard today, but then they started applying it to women's voices, to women's rights, and then, I don't want anybody to gasp, but the, the uh, lead singer in Mashru'a Layla decided to come out as a gay man. And of course, the second, you know, he decided, because, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot of musicians where people think they are, they may be, or they may not be. But this guy probably said, I am, and the world collapsed around him in uh, Lebanon, in the Arab world. Uh, Lebanon still tends to be a little bit more on the liberal side, also we thought. Two weeks ago, they banned the, the, they banned the band in Lebanon. That was heartbreaking for me because we always thought, you know, at least there'd be a little bit of room for uh, diversity or freedom of speech there. Nevertheless, his name is Hamid Sinno, and I'm just going to show you what Mashru'a Layla does in terms of the way they mobilize the masses. This is in Jordan. Welcome. Marks them up at this point. <laughs> Lebanese band Mashrua Layla performing in Jordan's capital Amman at its historic citadel. Their lyrics are satirical and the issues they discuss often controversial and they're fast gaining ever more fans across the region. I think we're touching on stuff that everyone had big question marks about at this point. Everyone from my generation. Like, I can't really look at the way my parents live, where their friends live, where most people from that age bracket live, and say I can expect the same to happen for me. So that was Hamid Sinno, the lead singer of Mashrua Layla in Beirut. This is uh, maybe they, had, they were starting to gain momentum. Um, please look them up, Google them. Uh, Mashro Layla means project of one night or it means Layla's project. Just Google what this guy is doing. He is challenging uh, notions of uh, masculinity and patriarchy and uh, marginalized sexualities in the Arab world like no one's done in recent times. He's still, uh, he's very brave, but of course he's getting, you know, death threats. He's, they just got banned in Egypt. I'm very sad to say that Jordan banned them. The video you saw was them performing in Jordan. But then the next time they tried to perform, I guess they had gained momentum and, and they were banned there. Any thoughts about uh, what you saw in terms of uh, Mashru Leila Adam? Yeah, I really appreciated that, that you, you drew out that attention to sort of the different approaches to gender and sexuality, because it seems like in the, in the Tunisian examples, 
of General, maybe, um, he's writing about, you know, you see your daughter being dragged out by the police. Would you allow that to happen? And there's this sort of patriarchal feminism of right. you're only going to be engaged when it's, you know, they're ripping out, they're attacking our veiled women, right? It only it portrays a certain kind of feminism and patriarchy as it relates to that protective role. And this seems like a very radical and there and obviously within rejected kind of a reception. Yeah. Adam, they have a new video called Roman, okay. and, it, and it included, I think, about 60 Arab women, and they wanted to make sure that the women spoke to, uh, you know, for themselves, by themselves. Um, I think there's also a little bit of an alliance that's going on between feminists and, you know, LGBTQ groups in, uh, in the Arab world, and it's reminding me a little bit of the 60s in this country, where, you know, people are demanding there. So, but, um, yeah, certainly, I mean, it, it, there was a woman, a young woman who was part of Mashru Layla, but she quit after a few years. It was nice to have her be part of the group. Now they're just four young men, but certainly they are doing exactly that. They are tying in notions of, um, uh, you know, uh, of uh, women's rights along with uh, marginalized sexualities. And boy, he is, this guy single-handedly is making an impact on the music scene and on the social scene in the Arab world. He's talking about everything from, you know, safe sex to uh, safe spaces to uh, trying to build NGOs within the Arab world that would house, um, you know, teenagers who were kicked out of their house because of their sexual orientation, things like that. And it's all embodied in the music. So that's Mashru Alayla, everybody. Uh, I, uh, please look at their uh, body of work and let me know what they think. If we had more time, I would play one of their videos over here called Ghadan Yawman Afbal, Tomorrow is a Better Day. But I'll leave it to you to listen to that when you need a little uh, inspiration later. Um, there is uh, uh, the next stage, I think, in the, Arab, in the music of the Arab Spring involved collaborations between musicians that came from different parts of the Arab world. So here you've got this young man named Zaid Hamdan, who combined his talent with a singer. Her name is Maryam Saleh. She comes from Egypt. Uh, this, I think, Adam, you will like because it's, it, it's a discourse that centers in a way on the veil, on the hijab. And whether, you know, are women who wear the hijab oppressed? Uh, what about in this country when a woman does want to wear a hijab and in the climate that we're experiencing in America today are afraid to you to wear the hijab? So, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't want to answer for women in general, but it seems to me to be a pretty uh, straightforward thing. It is not up to men. It is not up to governments to tell women what to wear or not to wear. So if, if a woman who did, after, you know, she feels spiritual, she believes that her religion looks fondly upon that. It's almost to me like I don't understand why the hijab is seen so differently than what a nun would wear in Christianity. Where a nun wearing that, we kind of grew up watching, you know, nuns being represented so positively. on America. But then when, the, when that same, you know, veil or you know or formation of it is on a Muslim woman it's immediately she's oppressed having said that I am against the oppression obviously of any woman I'm defending women's rights in the Middle East when they tell me I'm being forced to wear it my parents my whatever are forcing me to obviously she shouldn't be forced to but I'm finding myself in a very weird situation in America where I'm actually defending the right of women to wear the veil so again, it depends where you are. I'll, so, so you want to see her with the veil and without the veil. I think she's trying to say, that, you know, I can wear it when I want. I cannot wear it when I want. Or women can choose to do whichever they want. So you realize it's the same uh, singer, right, in both cases. Uh, Maryam Saleh, she is revolutionary and she is uh, 
she, I don't know, she represents the voice of so many Arab women who are sick of being categorized as he's an oppressed or, you know, um, she's, she's doing both, I think. Uh, Adam, what did you think? That kind of related to what you're asking. Yeah, about. and I was I was struck. It sounded if it sounded like MIA. <laughs> Missing A. Right? right. You know, you know, MIA the Sri Lankan? Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. I thought you were saying missing in action. Oh no, sorry, not missing in action. <laughs> MIA, the Sri Lankan sort of revolutionary transnational rapper. The sounds that, that and sort of the way her her cadence, her staccato, and the all of the I'm sounds. I'm this brought... down, Adam. Check MIA right after presentation. Token on to Adam. Yes, of course. I mean, I would love to. I love when people make a connection to even Western singers. You know, you can see this is like Joan Baez in the '60s. Not her necessarily, but maybe Aman Matlouzi has been uh, likened to that. How is everybody else feeling about this music so far? I, I have a comment again. Yes, Lauren. I'll be Adam Jr., I guess. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I, I, talk, I talk about Syria in many of my classes because I, I find it to be really interesting to use as an environmental example. Oh, there it is. Yeah, okay. go, ahead, go ahead, Lauren. I'm just setting the stage for you. Oh, thank <laughs> you. I, I wondered if you see um, the issue of the environment in any of these songs. Can you elaborate a little bit, Lauren? Mm -hmm. So there, there is that issue of social justice and I completely understand the importance, but I, I'm wondering if they look at um, uh, shortage of water or how the land is being taken from them or um, how the, 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 the food sources are no longer as productive or how the government may be taking away their food production. Absolutely. Yeah, a lot of these singers um, are expressing in their song that they're torn between their governments, but then they're also being, they feel they're being exploited by the West too. So it's like, you know, you, if you pledge your allegiance to the West, you're, you know, seen as anti-Arab or you're that native who turned against their people, so the native informant, if you will. Uh, but certainly these issues you're talking about are at the heart of so much of the music that I've been listening to, whether it is water shortage, whether it is the damage to the environment, whether it is the way resources are being allocated, who's profiting from them, who's profiting from these wars. Um, absolutely. And this guy, Omar Ofendam, has a song called Hashtag Syria. Now this one is against the Assad regime and he's, you know, uh, he's kind of the voice of the Syrian revolution. But then, I mean, I don't even know what the Syrian revolution is at this point. It's gotten, um, you know, there's so many players in that scene right now that uh, what initially started as young people rising up to get more freedom, you know, get access to Facebook. You know, initially it was about that. And I will tell you that a lot of Lebanese uh, singers like Mashro Leila do say that. One of the problems in uh, Lebanon recently has been the garbage crisis. Did you know that, you know, the, the, they're polluting the beaches. There is no real recycling system in Lebanon. Uh, you know, the electricity goes out every other day. I mean, the Lebanese is just a weird way to be uh, if you're in Lebanon. You have no electricity yet, you know you have, you know, a very vibrant night scene with people coming from all over the world and, you know, having alcohol openly and all this. It's a very weird thing, but uh, they have the guts to talk about the environment, um, especially this garbage crisis. This is like in every new song I hear, they make a reference to, you know, come to Lebanon, but take a shower after. It hurts to hear that, uh, especially from a Lebanese but they're kind of right. I mean, it, for a while, Beirut was stinking with garbage and nobody was doing anything about it. It's being improved now, you know. Hopefully, we'll, the electricity will be next. But no, since you brought up Syria, Lauren, do you want to hear how Omar Ofendam uh, addresses, you know, the rule of the Assad regime? And uh, his song is called Hashtag Syria. See what you think of it. <laughs> Let's 
So these verses. So Omar Ofendem, who has many videos, as you can see, is a Syrian rapper living in the U.S. And one of the things he does that's different from the other musicians we heard is he does sing in English too. In fact, many of his raps are in English about Syria. But of course, he's a native Arab speaker. And his album is uh, called Syrian Americana. And I think that says it all, combining Syrian with Americana. A great album that has tracks in both um, English and Arabic. All right, shall I move to Tanya Saleh? Are you ready for Tanya Saleh? You may think you're ready, but you, you, read, you need a little intro. Uh, Tanya Saleh I met in Lebanon. She is, you know, she's one of the older uh, singers right now, more mature singers. And because of that, she's able to compose her own music, her own lyrics, and to distribute her material beautifully on her own. She's also a graffiti artist. She does amazing things. But Tanya Holt herself is, she's secular. She doesn't consider herself religious. But if you were to look at her background, she was born in a household that was half Sunni and half Shia. So for her, I think one of the most painful things is to see how the Shia and the Sunni have been fighting as if they're not both Muslims. And so to her, you, you guys know what the most popular uh, Sunni name is? Is everyone thinking Omar? Omar? Okay. And the most popular Shia name is Ali. Ali. And so her song is about Omar and Ali. She calls it Omar Wa Ali. And it's 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 simple, but it's so complicated. Uh, and basically she's saying. Omar and Ali, your brothers, you read the same Quran. You believe in the one Allah. I mean, you both speak Arabic, Arabic. I mean, there's so much more in common than there is that's different. And uh, why don't you just get up and kiss your brother Ali on the cheek? In fact, in fact kiss him on the forehead, which is even more of a sign of peace. Uh, here, is, here is Tanya performing Omar and Ali with English subtitles. So if only Omar would take a step towards Ali, or Ali would take a step towards Omar, according to Tanya, would be in a much better place. If you look at the screen, this is just a sample of the of or the amazing work that this woman has been doing for over 20 years. My dream is to bring her to Stanford and have her perform and have her show her art and her graffiti and, and her show. And she's just an amazing, amazing woman. All righty, shall we move to someone else? All right, we have to talk a little bit about what was happening with Palestinian singers, I think, and musicians during the Arab Spring, because, you know, they're kind of, I want to talk especially about Arab Israelis here, or, um, you know, those, we call them in Arabic, the Arabs of 48 or the Arabs who stayed. They're Israeli citizens. They are, you know, they can vote. They're part of the country, but also they feel marginalized. And when the Arab Spring was happening, how did these uh, Palestinian um, uh, musicians uh, attempt to use the Arab Spring to advance their own cause or to make their opinion known? So the answer, I think, comes in three letters, D-A-M which uh, is a group of three young men. They identify as Palestinian citizens of Israel. 
they speak perfect Hebrew and perfect Arabic, and they attempt to use both in uh, singing about uh, the, the way they feel in Israel and in the Arab world, because in a way, they're kind of marginal, or they feel that they're marginalized in both places. Um, and so uh, this is a very positive song that ended up being the uh, theme to an Arab, uh, to an Israeli uh, TV series that starred Arab and Israeli, uh, uh, you know, a Muslim, Christian, and Jewish characters living within Israel. It was kind of a comic thing. It was called uh, Arab Labor. And I think that series is available on Netflix as we speak. But uh, here's what they think about uh, hatred and the kind of uh, situation that's been going on in Israel slash Palestine for a very long time. What do you think of, were you able to read the subtitles a little bit? Any thoughts on what, what do you think the message is? Well, um, I thought it was positive. I thought it was, you know, about, you know, when you're born within a situation and you open your eyes and the first thing you see is, you know, he's Jewish, he's Muslim, he's Christian, what's worse now, like he's Sunni Muslim, he's great. You know, the idea is don't let that taint you and grow up thinking of Jews, Christians, and Muslims as brothers. And I think, uh, you know, that, that this kind of music does reach the young people. And maybe if it doesn't change minds, it's still going to have an impact. So they're called D-A-M. Do you know what it stands for? <laughs> You're going to laugh. The Arab MCs. But also, <laughs> I see you, Adam. Uh, but also, dam means to last in Arabic, so it's like a long-lasting thing. And also, dam in Arabic means blood. So there's so many ways to look at, the, at, at their names. I think they, they're, they're kind of trying to be funny. They go, oh, we're just the Arab MCs. But I think there's more going on behind their name than just that. Okay, let's end with 47 Soul. Have you heard of 47 Soul? No, everyone's shaking their head, no. So you guys have a lot of homework to do, right? You're gonna have to go look up El General, then Aman Masuti, then Rami Islam, then Mashru Layla. Then you have to write a 50 page report and have it on my desk double space by Monday, where I shall now. I'm kidding. Uh, please do email me after you look at the playlist and take your time. And you know, it's, it's really unfair to play a few seconds from each video for you and expect you to be able to react. But I think once you see it, also let me know what you liked, what you didn't like. I plan to update this um, uh, presentation because uh, there's a lot of new talent coming out uh, since the, even since the summer. But um, this is the new wave of indie alternative music taking over the Arab world. It is called Champ Step. And it is this new dance that people have come up with. And I went to Jordan this summer. They were doing the sham step at every party, the young people. And uh, I went to London and this group was in London. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm in London to watch this Arab group perform. They, uh, you know, they combine English and Arabic. So they appeal to everybody. Their music is addicting. It makes you want to dance. And this is the song called More Light in Arabic, Rough uh, it, it has that beat, I think, that, and when you see them in concert, they're just as powerful um, as the video clips. So uh, if you're interested in that, watch their new videos. They're, again, they're called the um, 47 Soul, and the song that made them famous is called um, Sham Step. The one we heard here was called More Light. So the, uh, the YouTube uh, playlist is there for you. We only played a few songs today from it, but feel free to peruse it. And uh, the reason I think this is a good playlist for non-Arabic speakers is because I have, like sometimes I've actually done the uh, subtitles myself and added them to the video. Um, YouTube is allowing now people to submit subtitles. Um, so I, I'm try, I tried to have videos where there were subtitles in English 
uh, so that you can get a feel for the words. But beyond the words, I think the music uh, functions on a different level. And hopefully you were able to see how music today is able to uh, do what politics has failed to do. Any last impressions? So do I stop sharing my screen here uh, so that I can see everybody without necessarily stopping the meeting, uh, Denise? Yeah, I well, I mean, I, you, can you stop sharing my screen? Yeah, sorry, oh, oh my gosh, Denise took over my, my, my laptop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very, Denise. Uh, so now I can see everybody here and uh, hopefully everybody can see me depending on the view that you chose.